everybody welcome again to our part of the world I know it took you some of you a really long time to get here and there's a lot of jet lag and this is what we have to do when we go visit you every time so <laughs> but thank you seriously it's wonderful to be here and we appreciate the the hosts and the local chairs Claire and uh, Adam for their um, efforts to give us this opportunity to share a bit more detail about the epidemiology of what's happening in HIV here in our region. Uh, next, oh, there we go. And these are my disclosures. Uh, we receive grants for community as well as research. So before I get started, I wanted to give us a little bit of context for the Asia Pacific region. So where we are now represents a little more than half of the world's total population, 4.4 billion people. But we are, of course, very different depending on what part of the region you go to between the Pacific, Southeast, East and Northeast, and South and Southwest Asia. And the larger numbers are driven in the East by China and in the South by India. We're also the region with the second largest burden of people living with HIV at 6.5 million, but we have very low prevalence at 0.2% of all adults. And this is why in the slides that you just saw from Dr. Ivy and Dr. Anna, we tend to all be lumped into the remaining countries category. I think some of you come from countries like that too. Uh, we're also, no Asian country has been included in the Global Alliance first phase because we're not considered high burden countries. But what I hope I can do for you today is to show you that in fact, there are a number of gaps in our maternal HIV and vertical transmission prevention activities. There are children, adolescents, and young adults who are now growing up with perinatal acquired HIV who are transitioning to adult life and new HIV infections are often occurring among young people and especially young key populations. I'll be focusing today mostly on South and Southeast Asia, highlighting data from around nine different countries, and we will hear more detail about the Pacific Island nations from Dr. De Jesus and Dr. Boma during tomorrow's presentation. So HIV in pregnant women across the region, there are 55,000 of them that have been estimated last year who are in need of ART annually. And you can see some of the HIV testing coverage there in the graph below. We go from the Philippines on this graph of about 20% HIV testing coverage up to Cambodia, which is almost 100%. And if we look at the pregnant women living with HIV, I mean, kind of think about this in comparison to the countries where you come from. The largest burden or the largest number is in India, and then the smallest in this graph, at least, is under 200. And there are other countries in the region with less than that as well. But consider the total births in these countries and the number of women who would need to be tested for HIV and antenatal care in order to get those testing rates up. 23 million births in India in one year, 6 million in Pakistan, 3 million in the Philippines. So the burden on public health programs in order to achieve some of the measurements, the metrics that we're looking at could be quite high. And I also want to mention that all of the data are from the UNAIDS 2030 report available online now that uh, Dr. Anna and Dr. Mary gave me early access to. Thank you again for that, unless otherwise noted in the footnotes. Some of you may be a bit more familiar with our successes, in particular global validation of elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and congenital syphilis, and most recently, hepatitis B. And that's because Thailand achieved global validation in 2016 to much fanfare and to great pride within the region. A few years later, that was matched by Malaysia in 2018, and then Sri Lanka and the Maldives in 2019. So far, none of them have added hepatitis B, but we are very hopeful that that will happen in the next few years, at least for a few of the countries within our region and across the world. But 
the global ART coverage rates, when you look down region by region, show that we're actually not doing so well on a regional level. Asia and the Pacific in the last few years have only been able to cover about half of the women who needed antiretroviral therapy to prevent trans infant transmission. And you can see from region to region, we're kind of more similar to West and Central Africa, despite having a very different uh, development uh, structure in terms of our GDP and other measures of economic development. And not surprisingly then, our <laughs> infant transmission, vertical transmission rates are also quite poor. We have the second worst rate, second highest, at 23%. About 60% of these are occurring before six weeks of age and about 40% during breastfeeding. Some people think that in the Asia Pacific, we're formula feeding region, mostly because of what you've heard about Thailand and Malaysia, but that's obviously not the case for all of the countries where pregnant women are living and where infants are at risk. But if you dig down deeper into the individual countries, this is where I, I think for some of you, I hope this will be a surprise. And for many of us in the room, sadly, it was not. At the top, you see the countries that are performing well, that have been globally validated, Malaysia and Thailand. 90 plus percent ART coverage in pregnancy, vertical transmission in a breastfeeding, in a non-breastfeeding country of 2%, early infant diagnosis, testing of over 90%. If you make your way down to the bottom, you can see Myanmar, Indonesia, Pakistan, and the Philippines. And I just double-checked the ART coverage and pregnancy number on the UNAIDS website right before this because I kept asking myself, is it really 6%? And so far, at least uh, Dr. Anna and Dr. Mary have not changed that. But you can see that this very low ART coverage rate in pregnancy gets us vertical transmission rates of up to 40%. And the early infant diagnostic testing is also quite poor. And so this is a major gap that does not get enough attention when you look at the positive successes that are occurring within our region. And when you look at the total numbers, because these are smaller countries that contribute smaller numbers to the epidemic, and they are getting lost. If we look at the populations of children and youth living with HIV in the region, we have 130,000 children under 15, 150,000 adolescents, 10 to 19, and 440,000 young adults. And on the right side, you see sort of similar trends in that a country like India would have a lot more, and a country like Malaysia, at least in these examples, have a lot less. But I want to draw your attention to the right two columns of adolescents and young adults. And look at the difference between the adolescents and the young adults, even though there's some overlap in that 15 to 19 age group. We're starting to see increasingly the adolescents who we've been caring for with perinatally acquired HIV, when they get older, they get merged into that young adult data. And those young adult data, well, they get lost because the numbers are so much larger. So they're increasingly hidden, and if we don't figure out ways to tease out those data, we don't know what has happened to them as they get older. And this is why it's been so critical to have regional research cohorts, and in Asia, the, really the only one is the Treat Asia Pediatric HIV Observational Database, or TAPOD, which is part of the IDEA Global Consortium. So we have had about 7,700 children and adolescents ever in care in 18 centers in six countries listed, but the median ART start across this cohort was seven. So you recognize right away that this is already a survivor cohort. About 2,900 of them are still in active follow-up. Their age was 14. Those who had CD4 counts had very good CD4 counts, and almost all of them were tested for viral load and suppressed. But you can see on the right side that we're starting to transition out our patients as they get older. 35%, 31%, 13% are now getting older to the point where we're sending them over to adult HIV care. And unlike in some settings where you have family-centered care, such as is probably the more of the norm in Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't do that. We have adult, uh, sorry, freestanding pediatric centers that send them to freestanding adult centers. So we tend to lose them. And this is why it's been so important to encourage national programs to track their patients over time. And that's exactly what the Thai pr national program is doing. This is the latest data. It hasn't been published yet. Thanks to Sarinya Tiranan Chai for allowing us to share this data for this presentation. 
There are almost 5,600 children ever diagnosed and put on ART in the country, and their median age of diagnosis was also seven. So again, a survivor cohort that's reflective of some of the earlier practices with barriers to treatment, to testing and treatment. But thanks to the commitment of Thai pediatric HIV doctors and the national program, which includes HIV treatment for free for all of the kids, we've only lost 13% and 16% have died. At their last visit, you can see there were older, median age of 16. Uh, two thirds of them were suppressed, but 42% already on dolotegravir and a third remaining on non-nucleotide reverse transcriptase inhibitors and 19% on PIs. But what I want to point out here is the 20 to 24-year-olds make up a quarter of them. So these are young people with perinatally acquired HIV. And if you think about what they've been through to get to this age, they have experienced so much emotional, physical, social challenges to survive at this point, let alone thrive. And it's the question of thriving, I think, that has concerned more of us within the region as they get older. So they themselves have really experienced the legacy of the poor treatment access, but not just for them, also for the adults in their lives. So 70% of the kids in our cohort studies have lost at least one parent, 19% have lost both of them. 45% were on second line by the time they were ready to transition to adult HIV care. Disclosure continues to be a challenge as it is, I think, around the world. Median age of disclosure was 13. It's just so uncommon, even after that, for them to share their status with other people. Some Thai researchers have been studying this for a number of years now and shown that 40% have shared their HIV status with their partners. But overall, the major driver of this, of not wanting to share, is this fear of stigma that they experience. As I mentioned, we have a low prevalence of people living with HIV in Asia. That leads to low community awareness of HIV because most people don't know other people who are living with HIV. So we also don't have high levels of awareness around things like pre-exposure prophylaxis or U equals U that could potentially make those discussions less tense for them. So the biggest secret that they have had since the time that they were disclosed to is don't tell anybody that you have HIV. And so we actually asked older uh, Asian youth after they had transitioned to adult care, is this still an issue for them? And in fact, about two thirds of them still agreed that they needed to keep their HIV a secret. So we did a small qualitative study and just a few of the quotes are there on the right. And a 20 year old female when asked about why didn't you tell people about your HIV status? She, she said, I didn't know which of them would accept it and I didn't want to be bothered by it, so I didn't tell and that was it. It's a very pragmatic decision that they are making. And the quote below that from a 24 year old male, this is in the context of him trying to get a job and make money and live as an adult. I don't know how much knowledge my employer has on this topic, so I'm not sure if he's going to be able to accept it or not. I think it's just better to conceal it. Having to keep secrets like this for your whole life puts a lot of pressure on them, socially and mentally. And this is kind of the next phase of the work that we've been doing in the region, looking at mental health issues in post-transition young adults. So in an initial regional study, we found that 17% reported moderate to severe depression, 13% had current suicidal ideation, after that study, there was a more detailed one that was led by Dr. Linda Arpibul in Thailand, about 355 young people. 18% had depression, 29% had lifetime suicidal ideation, 11% had already tried to kill themselves, 10% had anxiety, 14% had harmful alcohol use, 11% other substance use, and their quality of life, even so, half of them said it was good, but the other half of them said, well, it's moderate, it's okay. And this is why we're trying to do more work around issues of mental health and suicide. And there will be two posters presented by Dr. Tavitia Sujari Truk here during the conference today and tomorrow. And if you have questions about that, I encourage you to look at that. And Dr. Natalie Song Tawisin will also speak about this during her presentation on mental health tomorrow. So briefly about new infections, as was mentioned earlier by Dr. Anna or in the map that she showed, 300,000 people had newly acquired HIV in our region. 
but 96% of them are all key populations or their partners. So if you look at that as well, it breaks down to 26% are young adults, 15 to 24. If you overlay those two groups, young adults who are key populations are really our biggest target and the biggest risk for HIV acquisition. And so what are the barriers to young people being able to access HIV testing, prevention, and care? Well, pediatricians in the room know it's getting an HIV test without having to tell your parents or your caregivers. And sadly, there are still a few countries that have a limit of 18 before you can get a test, Cambodia and India. But fortunately, in countries like Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, those age ranges have been coming down. And it is something that we need to continue advocating for in order to create broader access to people. I'll share just a few final words about uh, AIDS-related deaths. And you can see there, as was mentioned earlier, 7,500 children, 1,100 adolescents, and 3,400 uh, young adults have died. But it's really hard to look at these data without putting them into some kind of context. They sort of just look like numbers on, in this particular way. So Reshma Kasanji did an analysis of mortality in children with HIV on treatment through the Global IDEA Consortium. And you can see that on the right. And Asia, which which is in the far right in black. We did pretty well in terms of like how bad our death rates were compared to other regions in IDEA. But I think we still need to compare what's happening with children with HIV to those who do not have HIV. And in Thailand, based on the newest data, it looks like children with HIV have about five times higher incidence of death. And this reminds us that even in a country that has universal health care, can provide HIV treatment and care for free, including viral load, including dolotegravir. We still aren't doing enough. All of us need to do more to address issues of adherence, to simplify regimens, to advocate for closing the gaps in care that they experience. And so hopefully you have seen by digging down into the data that there are weaknesses in national, maternal, and pediatric HIV prevention and treatment coverage that are hidden in the Asia Pacific regional data. And we really need stronger advocacy to close those gaps. Prevention programs have to prioritize older adolescents and young adults in key populations if we're going to slow down the epidemic within our region. But there are now growing cohorts of adolescents and young adults with perinatally acquired HIV who are transitioning into adult life and adult care. Our clinical centers need feasible transition care standards to be developed. We do have a few, some of them in some countries, but there's no consistency across them. And they've been sort of applied in different kinds of ways. And these standards must be informed by adolescents themselves. Because as somebody who cared for kids when they were much younger, my priorities are not the same for them. I started taking care of them when they were little, and now they're big. And what they want in this world is different. And the example I can give you is this painting. So in this painting, there's a young person in the middle. And I thought, OK, the young person with HIV painted this. They're the person in the middle. And the people around them are their parents, their caregivers, their doctors. They want to walk forward in the road together. And actually, that is totally not what this person meant. This young man named Kay, he said, for my future, I would like to have a family, house, rice farm, job, and money, which I earn for a living. I am now on the way to the future. So he's actually the person on the far left of this painting. And the other people, they're not me. They're not his parents. They're his own children. It's his kid. It's his partner. That's what he wants for the future. That's what he wants us to help him achieve and attain. And that's why it's so critical that it is adolescents and young people who are the ones guiding us as they make these transitions as we figure out how best to support them. So I want to acknowledge the Treat Asia Pediatric Network of IDEA Asia Pacific on whose data much of this talk was either inspired or made. Uh, Anna and Mary from UNAIDS for providing me that early access to these data, which really helped 
in getting this ready. Azar Karaminia and Serenia Tarananchai, who gave, us, uh, gave me some additional data to be able to share with you. And then a lot of people who helped with little bits of, of questions that I wanted to know about the, the presentation that you saw today. And finally, the two young people who gave me permission to share their paintings with you during my presentation. Thank you very much for your time.